In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. I want to share a few verses from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 10, beginning with verse 11. The scripture says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who calls upon him. Thank you. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to ask for a volunteer, please, to come up here in front of everyone. Okay, you're quite a courageous soul. Okay, okay, come, please. We'll ask you. Okay, how about both of you come? Okay, since you're both quite courageous. Okay, come beside me here, please. You, sir. Okay, can you... Uh, I'm going to, whenever I ask a question, both of you are going to answer it, okay? So start by uh, your name, please. Sam. Mike. What did you say? Michael. Oh, Mike. 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 I thought you were from that Finding Nemo movie. Mike, 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 Mike. Okay. Just speak clearly, man. Don't be shy. They're not going to buy it or anything. I know they look scary a bit, but they're actually not as bad as they look. So just speak from the heart, okay? Mike. Okay. <laughs> Sam and Mike. Okay, Sam. What do you know about feet? About feet? Uh, you got five toes, helps you, uh, helps you keep your balance, you can walk on them. Okay, feet keeps you on your feet, I guess. <laughs> keep, makes you keep your balance. Okay, what else? What else do you know about feet? You wear socks on them. <laughs> okay, that's a good observation. Okay. They're what keeps you above the dirt. Huh? Okay, keeps you above the dirt. What else? What else do you know about feet? It could smell bad. Especially if you're in high school, man. I've, I've been to some of those conferences, and I've been to, like, boys' dorms, and as soon as you enter, the first thing that hits you is the... Bad smell. Bad smell. Yeah. Exactly. Have you ever seen anyone compliment someone else for having, like, nice feet? Yes. <laughs> That's not really the answer I was expecting, but can you share with us when you heard someone complimenting someone else for having, like, nice, cute little feet? One of my friends loves staring at people's feet. It's kind of weird sometimes. <laughs> One of your friends stares at people's feet? Yes. If I were you, I'd, like... I Friends. Oh, you have weird friends, okay. I'd, I was going to ask you to reconsider your, <laughs> your friends who stare at people's feet, okay. I've done, a few times. Huh? I've done that a few times already. You stare at people's feet? No, I've reconsidered who my friends should oh, be. Okay, okay. Okay, I was worried that you're one of those people who stares at people's feet. Okay. What about you, sir? Have you, do you have any friends who stare at people's feet? I know people who are afraid of feet. You know people who are afraid of feet? They're afraid of the toes. I think I'm seeing the weird phobias here in that church. Abuna, we need to talk after this. <laughs> someone who stares at people's feet, someone who's afraid of people's feet. Oh my goodness. This is a learning experience for me. Oh my goodness. So you know people who are afraid of feet from, from, from toes? Yanni, a little here, maybe the foot, like the bottom of the foot, Yanni, it's, it's tickly, it's like people make it funny, I don't know. I know people who are afraid of feet, but that's because of martial arts. 
Oh, martial arts. Okay, we're going to a whole different like, like dimension. Ah! Oh my goodness, I hate those feet. Please don't kick me with them. Like, isn't the guy who's on the martial arts like supposed to be kicking back? Or <laughs> like, why is he afraid of someone? It hurts. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> okay, so feet smell. Feet hurt. Feet are scary. Why did God create us with like feet? Only God knows. <laughs> okay, God knows. I guess we'll know in, in eternal life. You have some friends who look at people's feet and compliment them. <laughs> okay, it's a weird hobby, but uh, I respect you, man. Yeah. I respect your friends, whatever they, you know, they do to keep them happy. <laughs> feel the same. <laughs> How do you feel? Like, like, suppose like a guy loves a girl so much and he wants like to propose to her and he looks at her eyes and he looks at, his, at, at her hair and he says like, baby. <laughs> baby. And he's like all blushing and everything. I love your feet. <laughs> How do you feel? How do you feel she would respond to him? I think she'd just give him that look like, wait, what? <laughs> How do you think she would respond to him? Thank you. <laughs> uh, ladies, would you say thank you to someone who compliments you on your feet? Really? How many of you would say, aww? How many of you would like be like touched with the compliment? I love your feet. Not your eyes, not your hair, not anything else. Your feet. I'd be confused. <laughs> huh? I'd be confused. Ah, confused. Ladies, how many of you would like smack him on the face and say, go find someone else? Is that the only compliment you found about me? You're not a girl. I said, girls. Why are you putting up your hand? Maybe a girl compliments me on my feet. I say thank you. Okay. How can she compliment you on your stinking, smelly feet, man? Feet, we already said feet are like stinking, smelling, scary. I'd wonder where she saw them. I always wear boots. <laughs> I always wear boots. Okay, guys, give them a big hand. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Feet. The mystery of life. Feet. I'm sure all of you are talking to the person. Why is Abuna talking about feet so much? I thought we're here to talk about, like, God, about, like, something good. You know, one of the most confusing verses in the Bible to me, that every time I look at them, is this verse that I just read for you today. From Romans chapter 10, verse 15. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. How beautiful are the feet? God? You're saying this to us? How beautiful are the feet? Like, compliment our intelligence, compliment our hair, compliment our eyes, our ministry, anything. But how beautiful are the feet? After everything we heard now about feet from our two kind volunteers who kind of like are all disoriented. <laughs> and <laughs> Why do you think that God is saying to us, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Why? No, you already lost your credibility, man. <laughs> no more questions for you. This guy is sad. <laughs> okay, those who have an answer, put up your hand, and then some of our volunteers could, could kindly go to them. Why is God telling us how beautiful are the feet if the feet are stinking and scary and big and <laughs> weird? Why is God saying how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Why? Yes, sir. 
But there is, where is the, there were some other mics? Okay. We need to rush a little bit faster so we don't waste too much time. Please. We call that guy in Toronto spaghetti because he's like thin and tough. Go ahead, Javi. Well, maybe when they preach, they like travel all over the world on their feet. Ah, those who preach, that's a key answer actually. Travel all over the world on their feet. Okay, don't they have any cars or like bikes or something there? <laughs> okay, what else? How beautiful are the feet? Yes. Well, maybe he's trying to say that if, like, if the most disgusting part of their body is their feet, and he's complimenting, can you imagine how the rest of their body is? Oh, that's deep, man. <laughs> that's deep. Ooh. Say that again, that's worthy to be encore, encore. If he's trying to say that if the most disgusting part of their body is beautiful, then the, most, the rest of their body The most beautiful. disgusting part of, I wouldn't call the feet like the most disgusting part of the body. I'm sure there are other things like armpits and stuff like that, but thank God there are no, like no verses about armpits in the Bible, thank God. But I mean, it's one of those places that you want to stay away from as much as you can. So if it's that bad and God is complimenting it, how much better could be other people? What about the ladies? What do you guys think? Why is God saying how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace? Ah, yeah. The ladies. How beautiful are the feet? Yes, one answer here. Thank you. Um, I think he means um, if someone is preaching the word of God, that means they're walking in the path of God. Yeah, actually, that's key. Thank you. So all your answers were actually correct. Back in the day, what happens was that people walked mainly all over the place, especially those who are like simple, okay? Those who are not very rich, they walked and they followed their master. Some of the old Jewish tradition who look at the disciples who walk in the footsteps of their teachers and they would be covered in their dust and they would say blessed is the person who's covered in their teacher's dust what does that mean they walked in their footsteps for miles and miles and miles to bring the good news to different cities and different countries and people who have not heard the word of god so that part of the body which is most covered in dust would be praised the most that's why God says, how beautiful are the feet? Because they are covered in the dust of the ground that they walked upon in following their teacher or preaching about the message of God. How beautiful are the feet? I find it odd sometimes. But yes, the people who work in hiding, the people who have no one to notice them or to think them are doing the most work for the kingdom of God. You know what, me, maybe as, as, as a clergy member, I stand on the pulpit, people see me, they praise me, or they don't, sometimes, whatever it is, bring tomatoes, throw at me, or whatever they want, some ups, some downs, but overall, people want to see the famous uh, preachers, the people who are well known, this and that, and they get the most praise, and the reward is cancelled from heaven. But there are so many people who are doing the work of God in hiding, just like feet, but they're not, I promise you they're not scary, they're not stinking or anything. They are doing it in hiding, and God who sees in the secret, he rewards them in heaven. As you can tell that God notices those who want to spread the good news. That's why our topic tonight is about evangelism. It's about speaking the word. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach or who evangelize the word of God, who share the word of God with others. Now, I went to uh, South Africa a few years ago, and when I was there, I was told of a story concerning the tribes there. When the elder or the leader of a tribe, tribe is about to die or to pass away, this person would gather all the tribe around him, the young and the old and the women and the children, everyone gathers around them to hear the most important words which he is going to say, which will be his last words before he passes away. And this, you know, everyone would be sitting so attentively to hear out what will these words be. And whatever he says, this is the conclusion. This is the summary of his entire life and his entire experience. If we apply the same rule to the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, who knows at the conclusion of the Gospels 
What were the final words that our Lord Jesus has uttered? Who knows? Matthew 28. The end of the gospel, just before. Yes, sir? To preach the gospel. Oh, snap. Is it to preach the gospel to like everyone? Exactly. He said to preach the gospel to everyone. Here it is. So let's say uh, Matthew 28 verse 18. He came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, there's something else that the Lord said in the beginning of the book of Acts, just prior to his ascension to heaven. The beginning of the book of Acts. What did our Lord Jesus say? Who knows? You can cheat from in the Bible if you have the Bible. That's okay. What do you guys think? Hmm. Acts chapter 1. That's verses 7 and 8. Anyone has their Bible? Okay, let me, let me read it. So it says, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You shall be witnesses unto me. Go. How I need someone to summarize for me the message between Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20 and Acts chapter 1 verses 7 and 8. I want the summary. What are the final words that Jesus our Lord is leaving to his disciples here on earth? What does he want us to do? Hmm. Yeah. Just put up your hand and someone will come to you with the mic. Anyone? Do you guys speak English here? Is this, I don't, what, what's the common language here in New Jersey? Spanish? Cantonese? What do you guys, which language do you guys speak? Hmm? Broken Arabic? Broken English? Broken English? Broken Arabic. Okay, I just read them, I read a few verses in English. I need someone to summarize them for me. What is the message? that Jesus wants to say to us. Just a summary, one sentence. What's our role? What's our responsibility? Honestly. Mm. Please. Hmm. To witness and to disciple people. Witness as you disciple people. Excellent summary. What else? Give me something else. Give me something more. Huh. Dig deeper. Hmm. Witness. What's our role as, as disciples? Go, teach, preach, yes? Hmm. To spread the word. Spread the word. Now, let me ask you the question, excellent. Now, do you think, do you guys think that it is the role of a few specific people to observe this commandment? L let's be honest with each other. Like it's only like a few selected individuals who are going to carry on this message to go, to teach, to preach, to baptize. Uh, of course, baptism, you know, if it's something sacramental has to do with the clergy, right? But ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Is this command given to a very few and specific people? Or is it a general command given to the entire church in every generation? Let's, let's be honest with each other. Why are you being so quiet? What do you guys think, honestly? Is the question not clear? Huh? Maybe you're used to receiving not so much. Yes, sir. Huh? Well, uh, everyone's uh, job is to evangelize, but some people evangelize by uh, directly preaching the gospel. Some people evangelize by their actions. Mm. They, so people see Jesus through like the way they live life. Exactly. So, so, it is, so let's agree. Do you, how many of you agree that this is a general commandment given to the entire church in every generation? Honestly. Okay. Most of us. Okay. How many of you think that it's a specific command given to very specific people at a specific time and it doesn't apply to everyone else? How many of you think of that? 
How many of you have no clue about both questions and are just like raising your hand because everyone else just put up their hand? Okay, just a few, a few confused people, I guess. Yes, yeah, that feet guy again. Where's that guy with the feet? Okay, he's the guy who put up his hand. Okay, so this is a command that is given to each and every believer in the gospel to go and spread the word and preach to others. Now, maybe you're thinking in your mind, I can't go up and start to teach and to pray for people and be like, so, you know, thou art holier than thine. And, you know, giving people that impression and you're walking around in school with the Bible, with your head bent a little bit and your eyes closed, you know, down the school aisle or university and say, oh, no, no, no. Your tone of voice is too high. Have peace in your heart, man. Have peace. Peace, man. Peace. You look like one of those Bob Marley followers. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. No, man. It doesn't work this way. It cannot work this way. And it will not work this way. You'll be marked as the weirdos. You want to be weirdos? <laughs> no. You know what we want in our generation? Like, let's, let's be honest with each other. We want normal saints. How can that work? What's a normal saint? Does anyone understand that term? A normal saint, an everyday life saint? What does it mean? What, what, what do you think I mean when I say... What we're looking for in our generation is a normal everyday life saint. What does it mean? Anyone has a clue what, I, what I'm trying to say? You know what I'm trying to, do you have someone, is, okay. Go ahead. Uh, um, I was just going to say that I thought it would be like someone who, you know, goes to school, do, does well in school, just like lives life, but yeah. is still able to maintain a great connection with God. Exactly. That's exactly what I mean. A normal everyday life saint. Someone who doesn't look any different than anyone, everyone else. Okay, moderate, loving, kind. Someone who is good in their school, achieving, well achievers. And someone who resists temptation and lives a holy life. You know, ordinary saints are not people who have to stick out nowadays. No, they can camouflage. They could be like in the midst of so many people but they have self-discipline. They abide by their inner relationship with the Lord Jesus. These are people who have tasted and seen how good the Lord is. What's the biggest challenge that we face now in school? When we're tested, our faith is tested. And someone comes up to us and they say, oh, you're crazy, how can you believe in God? You know, this is all myth. No one believes in God anymore. No one believes that the church has any authority. What about those sacraments? And you have to go to confession. Da, 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 da. The best person in the scriptures was the man who was born blind. Who resisted and spoke against the Pharisees when they came and condemned him and they called him names. And when they said about Jesus that he is a sinful man, he is a sinner, he answered them with one amazing response. You know what he said? Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know. That I was, what? Blind, and now? I see. That's a personal experience. That's a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. If you think that Jesus is not God, I, I, I'm not a theologian. Maybe some of you will end up being good theologians, and you can be good apologetics, and you can defend the faith. Maybe some of you can, you know, respond something that is very um, philosophical. But for most of the people, an ordinary Saint would be someone, whether you think he's God or not, whether you think that my sins are forgiven or not, or your sins are forgiven or not through his blood, I don't know. One thing I know, that I was blind, which means that I was living a life of sin. I was not following God's command. I was ignoring the voice of God in my heart, and I had an encounter with God. I was blind, and now I see. My eyes are opened. And this man changed his approach towards the Lord Jesus from seeing him as a prophet into all the way, or a good man, into seeing him as Lord and God, and he worshipped him. 
For this reason, I will say we can never evangelize or preach or share our faith with others unless we have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I cannot explain this to you because this is something that you and I have to go out there and really seek the Lord with, diligently with all of our heart to say, Lord, I want my life to be changed. I cannot be the same anymore. After I've encountered you, after I've seen you, my life will never be the same anymore. St. Paul was one of those people. In Acts chapter 9, he was traveling to Damascus. He was a very zealous Jew. And he had some commands in order to go and to persecute the Christians. On the way to Damascus, what happened? He saw a bright light around him. And the power of God came about him. Which, and a voice of our Lord Jesus who said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuted. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What must I do, Lord? Go into Damascus and there you will be told. And then when Ananias prayed for him, what happened to his eyes? Scales fell from his eyes. This is what we want, spiritually speaking. And this became the basis of his testimony, St. Paul's testimony, which was mentioned in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, as he stood in front of kings and rulers, he told them about the history of his transformation. This is what we call spiritual maturity. So many times we are stuck in this cycle that we cannot come out of it. We can never come out of it. And it's a cycle of immaturity, it's a cycle of taking God superficially, not really going deeper into my spiritual life, sticking with old habits that keep bringing me down. And as Abuna was telling us earlier, oh, how much we need the sacrament of confession and of repentance. When one day I come to my senses and I say, Father, I have sinned before heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me as one of your hired servants. This is the spirit of modesty and repentance before God. When I come before him to truly regret all of my bad deeds and all of the things that I have done in the past. And I take the absolution from my confession, Father, and I have a new start and a new beginning to truly return back to God. This is the first level of preaching. I can never preach or share something about my faith that I myself do not have. Forget it. People now are too smart. People are too intelligent to see right through us. If I go and pretend to be this holy person and this amazing person and this church girl or church boy and this and that, and people know about this, and then I go at night and I, I get drunk or you know, I, I watch bad images or porn on, on the computer or I smoke like them or I consume alcohol or drugs or whatever, just like them, what's the first thing that will come to people's minds? This person is a fake hypocrite. All of the people who go to church are like that. That's the worst thing that could happen to us as a church is that people see right through us. Yes, you and I have our own weaknesses and we're still working through them. And we have to admit that we are no better than anyone else. But St. Paul said, I am who I am by the grace of God. You know what's the only difference between us and everyone else? We have our own weaknesses. And I'm the first one who has so many weaknesses. But I am who I am by the grace of God. The only thing that makes a difference is that I'm living by God's grace. What's the meaning of the word grace? Who knows what grace means? What's the meaning of the word grace? Hmm. Grace, Greek, charis, means an unmerited gift. A free gift. Something that we don't deserve. God gives to us a gift which we are undeserving. What is that gift? What's the gift? When we speak about God's grace, he gives us a gift that we do not deserve. What is it? It is, yes, salvation. Free salvation. And it's ready for you and I to grab only if we have faith. And that's why he says in the verse that we mentioned, Scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That's the message of evangelism. And that's the message of preaching. Whoever trusts in him will never be brought to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Now let, let me ask you a theological question. How many of you here are theologians? Do you even know what theologians mean? 
those who study theology or those who study God and everything about God. Okay, let me ask you, put, put your backs to that uh, bench class so I can see your lovely faces. Okay, if you don't show me your lovely faces, I'll ask you to show me your lovely feet. Okay, but I'd rather see your faces. <laughs> Why was it important for St. Paul to mention that there is no distinction between Jew and Greek? What's wrong with, what's wrong with them? Like, was there a problem in the first century between Jews and Greeks? What do you guys think? Why is it important to understand this concept? Because this is key when we share our faith with others. Yes? What, what was the problem? Like, why is it important for him to tell us that there's only one God, and this God is the God of both Greeks and Jews? Yes, sir. Hmm. Uh, the Greeks, like, they, like, they praise, like... Sorry? They, the, the Greeks, they, like, pray to, like, statues and stuff. And, okay. And then, yeah. And, okay, well, so... The, because they, they had both different religions... Okay, so the Greeks had different religions and different gods, and they prayed to, uh, you know, they were pagan and stones and all of these things. Okay, good. What else? Okay, we have two hands here. Because uh, a lot of the churches that would come, <clears throat> that would come after Christ's, uh, Christ's ascension would be uh, Gentile churches, not just uh, the, his original followers, the children of Israel. So he was saying that even though you, you're the sons of Israel and you had been following me all this time. The rest of the world are still, I'm still their father as well and uh, I'm their God and yours. Excellent. Okay. So the, 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 the conversion of the, of the Gentiles was going to come sometime in the, in the future. Okay. There's one, one hand here. Because hmm. <clears throat> at that time, some people were praising uh, St. Peter, some people were praising Apollo, and Saint, some people were praising praising St. Paul, and he wanted to tell them all to praise Jesus or God instead of all of them. Okay, excellent. So there was sectarianism, but at the end of it, he wanted to tell them that there's only one God. Okay, one more. Yes, sir. Because, like, the Jews were God's people from the beginning of time, like, when, oh. when they were with God from the beginning, but the Greeks, they weren't, they weren't God's people. But the preachers changed them like, to being Christians, but they still praise the same God with one salvation, and, and the, 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 um, the Holy Spirit was all inside all of them. Excellent, excellent point. So the Jews thought in their mind that God was a private property to them. You know, do you have a sign here outside of the church that says private property? Huh? Every property says private property for the owners. The Jews thought that God was only the God of the Jews. He made a promise or a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that your descendants will be like the sand on the seashore and like the star in the heaven. And this was it. That means if anyone was to be a part of this covenant, they had to come from the descendants of Abraham. But since the Greeks did not come from the descendants of Abraham, therefore they thought in their mind that they were not included in God's promises. And the Lord came in the New Testament and he said, no, my message is for everyone. There is no distinction now between Jew and Greek. Anyone saw my big fat Greek wedding? Yes. Some of you, how many of you saw that movie? You know how, how the dad thought, like he used Windex for everything, but that's beside the point. But do you know how the dad thought, like when he asked about the husband, like, is he Greek? When she said no, then she said it doesn't matter because you're either Greek or you're not. So in his mind, the whole world was divided into Greek on one side, and everything else on the other side. For the Jews, it was the same. They thought Jew or Gentile. Gentile just means not Jew, a non-Jew. But an amazing point happened in Acts chapter 15, where the Holy Spirit showed well before that to St. Peter, and he came and he witnessed in front of the apostles in Jerusalem that the church should also accept the Gentiles. That means the church is not for one ethnic group. The church is now open to anyone from any background. So the first point that we said, first and foremost, that God has commanded us, it is a command. 
go. When he says go, it's a command. It's not please, request, na na na. If you feel like it, if you don't feel like it, you can just sleep at home and watch a movie on your laptop. No. Go and teach and preach to the whole world. Jerusalem, starting in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's number one. The command is for everyone. Number two, God wants ordinary saints. He doesn't want us to, you know, stand with a special uniform on the street corner and start to preach, repent, or else you're all going to hell. That's not what he wants. This is not what God wants. God wants ordinary saints. People who camouflage, who look like everyone, who live in the world, who are witnessing to him through their life and their words. Number three, he is now opening the door for the whole world without any distinction. Jew or Gentile. Four and, four, and, and most importantly is how. What is our action plan? I'm going to be honest with you, and I think your congregation here is a dynamic and most amazing congregation. But let's be, let's be honest with, with each other. Because the church came out of a setting where, as Copts, we were persecuted for many centuries, evangelism is not allowed or permitted in Egypt, even though originally the Coptic church was one of the most dynamic church that promotes evangelism. Look at the Coptic church as it spread orthodoxy and the Christian faith to many parts of Africa, to many parts of Europe, even before some of the European evangelists you know, uh, preached in Europe, the Copts were there to, to preach and all over the world. After the Islamic invasion, etc., evangelism was cut down. Here we are in North America. And praise be to God that we built so many churches and communities and dynamic youth like yourselves. Like I can just imagine the effect that e if each and every one of us takes this mission, this ministry to heart, what will happen to North America? What will happen? A total conversion of this continent. Honestly, imagine. Because each one of us knows 5 or 10 or 20 people. And if we were able to witness to them, we have thousands of people who come to Christ. Unfortunately, we choose to be shy about our faith. I'm going to tell you a story. One of the converts who, who come to, to our church, one day he was attending a meeting. And then in comes this person from the door. And then the convert says to the other person, what are you doing here? So of course the other person who is like Egyptian by birth, he says, what are you doing here? So the guy says, this is my church. And the other guy says, well, I'm Coptic and I go to one of the Coptic churches that are in the area. So the convert says to him, I have known you for 10 years and I never knew that you were Christian or, or Coptic Orthodox. I never knew. And they meet after all this time. Why did this happen? Why do you think this person knew this friend for so many years and the topic never even came up? Let's be honest with each other. Why do you think? What are the reasons? What do you guys think? Do you understand the question? Okay, I'm doubting that. <laughs> but I know you're just being respectful to, to the place, which I appreciate. But like, it's really important that we're thinking together. Okay. A young lady has her hand up. Go quickly before she changes her mind. This is the quiet section here. Please put up your hand one more time so you can see you. And then we'll come back here to the front. Go, go, go. Um, I think that we don't really show it is because we're afraid of the fight that we might be up against. Like they might bring up points that we aren't able to answer and then we're stuck and we're afraid that we're going to doubt our faith because of the, the debate that we're going to have. Excellent point. We don't know what we're against. So we need training. We need understanding. Okay. What else? Huh? There was another comment here in the front, please. Yes. 
Um, like how they acted around each other. Probably wasn't Christian like. Just use the mic, please. Their actions. Their action. Yeah. yeah. Maybe their action didn't quite reflect that they were Christian, so it could have been a stumbling block. Okay. Any other reasons? Hmm? Yes. One comment here. Thank you. Uh, sometimes we're ashamed to like talk about like Christ because we're afraid of what people would say of us. So like the topic never came up. Yes, we're ashamed. The topic never came up. Sometimes people have the idea that Christianity is boring or it's not practical or it's not relevant to the day and age we live in. Whereas those who truly practice true Christianity are the people who live in peace and comfort and don't have so much drama in their lives. Uh, he broke up with me. <laughs> we were together for 10 minutes. <laughs> Oh my goodness, spare me the drama, please. Oh my goodness. Who's your true groom? Jesus is the true groom. So what, he broke up with you? Forget about him, shalut. Bye. He's the desire of our hearts. Yani, some boy, yani, broke up with you. So what? Those who truly have an encounter with the Lord Jesus are mature Christians and people look upon them and they envy them. Even if people in the world seem that they're happier because they have 20,000 different boyfriends and girlfriends and this and that, truly nothing satisfies the heart except the Lord Jesus. Just know that. This is the truth. And people near, need to hear that. They need to hear the message. How many of us have seen a friend who's going through a hardship and a trial and instead of giving them very psychologically uh, right advice, tell them, do you mind if we pray together? That's where we can start. Maybe God has a solution. Maybe I don't have a solution. Maybe my experience in life is not as much as other people, but how about if we just offer a prayer together? How about we have this event in the church? Why don't you come along? Come and taste and see how beautiful the Lord is. How beautiful. How about if we have... Bible study together in the school and gather all the people who might want to and then we can just open the scripture and the word of God and let the word of God affect people's heart. You know what is the most effective form of evangelism in our day and age? It is called relational evangelism. Who knows what that means? What does the word relational evangelism mean? Huh? Relational which means that you have to be in a relationship with someone and to convey to them the message of Christ. But doesn't mean relationship means, you know, opposite gender relationship. No, anyone that you know personally, a colleague, a friend, you know personally, you share with them the message and the word of God. It is not difficult. The church now in North America is not as bound as we were. You guys don't have an excuse. We, living in North America today, don't have an excuse for not evangelizing and sharing our faith with others. Your close friend whom you see or talk with on the phone for hours, you know, if there is a special on shoes somewhere, I don't, can we go out to buy shoes? Who cares about shoes? Care about feet, not shoes. <laughs> but share the message. Why do you share about the sale happening at Macy's or this or that or grocery store or whatever? Save this and you share it with your friends. But when it comes to your faith, we don't share it with our friends. I want to start concluding because I want to give you time to ask questions. I want us to think a bit about how can we practically share our faith with others. Maybe the word preach and evangelize. And talk to people is scary. And, and I totally understand that people have different personalities. Not everyone is an extrovert. Like not everyone has the uh, courage to go out and to speak with people and to guide them. Maybe some people do, do, but most don't. And I totally understand that. But how about sharing the word with your close friend one-on-one, -on -one, the person that you have a relationship with? How beautiful would it be if one day all of our churches all over the world would not only become ethnocentric churches, but multicultural or multi-ethnic churches. 
Like it's amazing. It's, it's, we praise God. Very few churches. Very few churches in the world today, when you go into a youth meeting on a Friday night, find that many youth in the church. For you to be here tonight, it means that you gave up something could have been extremely exciting to come and hear the word of God or see this weird abuna coming from a country that you guys think it's one of the states in the U.S., right? When people think, well, what's Canada? They think it's one of the states up there in the north somewhere. It means that when one of your friends asked you, or you asked her and you said, where are you going to? And I said, I'm going to the movies, I'm going to a bar, I'm going to hang out with friends. And when she asked you, where are you going? I said, uh, mm. I'm going to church. Or I'm going to church. Yes. Can't wait. So excited to go and to see and to hear the word. And maybe through your excitement, you can make her and make him more excited for God. But wouldn't it be even more amazing if we can go to the extra mile one extra mile to say, I'm going to church, how about you join me? How about we go together? And when we go together to church, everyone is going to be friendly. You know, sometimes in our churches we get into cliques and groups, and no one notices people as they come in. I know that you're really great here, and so many other places are great, but you say, oh, we grew up together for years and years and years. So when a guest comes into our church, no one notices them, that's a problem. But another problem, if people give them the look, oh, they're only here because, and they're not embracing and welcoming. How beautiful it would be if we live the commands of our Lord Jesus. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. We open the news every day and we hear bad news. Killings and accidents and volcanoes and earthquakes and murders and so many bad things. But what we have in our hands is the good news. There isn't any bad news in it. And this is a message that is worthy to be shared. I have to be convinced. I have to understand that I am a light that is walking around shining the light of Christ. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Imagine if you and I have no flavor anymore. How shall it be seasoned? This is who you and I. We have a purpose. We are living with a purpose today. And that's the entire message that I wanted to leave with you today. You are very valuable in the eyes of Christ. And you are created for a purpose. You're not an accident. You know, some parents go to their children if they have like a child later on in life and say, you are an accident. It's like the worst thing that you can tell a child. <laughs> there are no accidents with God. God has a plan and God knows what he's doing and he has created you for a purpose. So, shh. I just want to end by saying, no matter how your feet are, they are very precious in the sight of God. And even if they're not that clean, he wants to clean them. And even if they're not that stable, he wants to make them stable so that we can stand on solid ground and follow in his footsteps. My prayer for all of you tonight, maybe we'll meet again soon, maybe we'll not meet God, give you all long life and, and health. But if there is one message that I want to leave with you, I'm praying that we can all be these individuals who know that we have a calling in life. First, be transformed in the heart. Have this encounter with the Lord Jesus. Have a personal life with him. Don't just follow the crowds. Don't be one of thousands or hundreds of people who just come and go into the church without really connecting with the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a prayer life, have a confession, Father. Commit to the sacraments of the church. Read in your Bible. Spend some quality time with God. This way you know who he is. Secondly, know your mission and know your calling. And thirdly, go out there and make an impact into the world. Don't ever say that I'm a youth. I'm just one person. No, God has chosen you. 
God has known you, do not say that I am a youth because God will send you to the right place. You know FTFT? What's the, the verse of FTFT? Let no one despise your youth. First Timothy 4.12. No one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. So may the Lord continue to guide you, to protect you, keep you safe in his arms. May he always make you a blessing everywhere you're at. And I pray that we could always be in continuous growth for his glory. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.